Good afternoon. Uh, we'll have opening statements by the Secretary General and the Prime Minister, and then we'll have time for a couple of questions. Secretary General. Prime Minister Kalas de Kaya, welcome back to NATO. It's great to have you here. Uh, we are only two weeks uh, from the NATO uh, summit in Vilnius, where we'll take far uh, reaching decisions. Uh, to bolster our deterrence and defence and step up our support for Ukraine. The mutiny by Wagner mercenaries uh, at the weekend is uh, an internal matter for Russia. At the same time, it demonstrates once again that President Putin's illegal war in Ukraine is a big strategic mistake. It has deepened existing divisions and created new tensions in Russia. But we should not underestimate Russia. We must continue to support Ukraine and we must keep our defences strong. To send a clear message to Moscow and Minsk that NATO will protect every inch of allied territory. Since 2014, we have significantly reinforced our presence and readiness from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea, including in Estonia. NATO's multinational battle group in Tapa, led by the United Kingdom, helps to deter any aggression. Just last month, uh, Exercise Spring Storm demonstrated our ability to reinforce our presence uh, in Estonia up to brigade size level. Fighter jets um, and air defences from allies also help to protect Estonian skies. And allies have agreed a new rotational model for air and missile defence, allowing for swift transition from air policing to air defence. At the summit, we will take the next steps with new regional plans, assigned forces and capabilities, and enhanced exercise program, all backed by over 300,000 troops on high readiness. Support for Ukraine is another top priority for the summit. I welcome Estonia's leading role in providing critical aid and rallying the international community behind the Ukrainian people. We need to step up even more. At the summit, we will agree a multi-year package of assistance and upgrade our political ties with Ukraine. This will bring, bring Ukraine closer to its rightful place in NATO. We also need to invest more in our security. At the summit, I expect we will agree on a more ambitious defence investment pledge with 2% of GDP as the floor, not the ceiling. Here too, Estonia is leading by example, investing more than 2% of GDP in defence. The Vilnius summit uh, will be the first with Finland uh, as a member. And we're working to finalise Sweden's accession as well. Therefore, I have called another meeting of senior officials from Turkey, Sweden and Finland next Thursday. The time is now to welcome Sweden as a full member of NATO. Let me finally uh, mention uh, Kosovo, which was also addressed in our meeting. Our CAFO mission continues to fulfill its UN mandate uh, impartially. We call on both parties to refrain from anything that can further escalate tensions and return immediately to the EU-facilitated dialogue, which is the only way forward. So, Prime Minister Kallas, uh, Del Kaya, once again, welcome to NATO. It's great to have you here, and uh, I appreciate very much your leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, dear Jens, uh, dear Secretary General, dear journalists. Um, as um, you know, we had a very, very good discussion, and I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be here in NATO headquarters today. Uh, we are living through uh, turbulent times, and I really thank you, Jens, for having a principal stance and building uh, allied unity throughout these difficult uh, times. It is increasingly clear uh, right now that Ukraine is winning this war uh, with the help of uh, transatlantic family uh, right um, behind it. And it is clear that um, the sooner Putin gets that it's uh, losing this war, the faster Russia will return to Russia. It is our joint responsibility to prove him uh, by our continued support to Ukraine uh, and our unity and decision making. Um, we also discussed uh, preparations for the NATO's uh, Vilnius summit uh, first. Uh, the permanent peace um, in Europe can only be uh, 
possible when we end the grey zones in the security of Europe. Grey zones are a breeding ground for instability and wars. Uh, it is experience of my own country that uh, NATO's membership is the safest, cheapest and the most credible way of deterring Russia. Russia's aggr aggression against Ukraine has also proved this point very clearly. The only thing that can end the cycle of aggressions against its neighbours is NATO membership. Hence, for peace, we need Ukraine in NATO. In Bucharest summit, allies agreed that Ukraine would become a member. Uh, this should not remain a hollow promise. What we need now is to define a practical path uh, to meet this goal. And we need to send a strong message of hope uh, to the Ukrainian soldiers in the trenches that uh, with NATO membership on the horizon, they are fighting their last war with Russia. And second, we made historic decisions in Madrid summit. Uh, these were truly significant changes in the policy and also in the mindset. Now we need to put these decisions in practice. All allies uh, need to continue to invest in security. This will make our transatlantic bond even stronger. Uh, by the time allies convene in Washington to celebrate this, uh, NATO's 75th anniversary next summer, we Europeans must also demonstrate the strategic leap not only in thinking, but also in real deliverables. Uh, for that, the defence of the NATO's European allies needs a truly decisive lift. We need to step up uh, combat effectiveness and we need deterrence credible enough to avoid the war and stop Russia's cycle of aggressions. For that, we need to increase defence investment spendings. Uh, for a credible deterrence and defence, it is key to close existing gaps uh, in our capabilities and also in our stockpiles. Our long-term aim should be 2.5% uh, of GDP. I know from experience how difficult it is for democratically elected leaders to argue for increasing costs on defence. Uh, in Estonia, we are increasing the defence expenditure to 3% of our GDP, and that requires raising taxes. And I can tell you, it's not popular. Um, but uh, time matters, and sending out right signals also matters. Uh, just to give you an example from my own country's history, in 1933, uh, the defence budget uh, increased uh, lacked political support in Estonia. In 1939, uh, the tenfold boost of defence investments was already too late. None of the equipment made it to the time to defend us in the Second World War and from the occupation that followed. Um, third, Russia has tried to blackmail NATO away from its neighbourhood. The outcome has been the opposite. Finland joined the alliance and I hope Sweden will be joining as well. Uh, so in conclusion, it is a long war uh, that Russia is uh, fighting. It will not be over until Russia accepts and respects Ukraine's statehood. Developments uh, within Russia should not blur our focus and resolve. Aggression must end in defeat. And long-term European security requires uh, Ukrainian membership in NATO. We have to work on the wording how to get there. For peace that lasts, we also need accountability. I know that this is not a, uh, NATO's topic, but I, I really want to stress this. Uh, we need the accountability for the crime of aggression, for Russia's leadership. Without the accountability, Russia's cycle of aggression, uh, Russia's cycle of constantly attacking its neighbours will just uh, continue and will never stop. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. Estonian public broadcaster in the middle. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll ask two questions from both of you. Um, my name is Jota Berg from Estonian public broadcasting. Uh, the first question is, um, if those new uh, regional defense plans make sure that realistically uh, the allied territory is defended in case of conflict from the first meter from day zero, until uh, the victory against any enemy, 
And the second question is, if Latvia and Lithuania should be fortified in the light of the presence of Wagner troops in Belarus? Thank you. First of all, we have to understand that NATO already has plans and capabilities in place to defend uh, uh, every uh, ally and every inch of allied territory. And then we are further strengthening our deterrence and defense, uh, partly by the decision we made in, in Madrid, and then uh, the implementation and the follow-up that will happen now in Vilnius. And this is about uh, uh, assigning specific forces to specific territories, and uh, also to increase readiness of our uh, forces. The main purpose uh, of uh, this is uh, actually not to fight the war, but to prevent the war. Mm -hmm. And the deterrence has worked for more than 75 years, mm -hmm. uh, or for almost 75 years for, uh, for this alliance, since we were founded in 1949. And, um, and, uh, and therefore, this is partly a question of forward presence. We have increased our presence also in the Baltic region. Uh, but also about uh, uh, high readiness, the ability to quickly reinforce and uh, prepositioned equipment. And then we have to remember that the, uh, the, the capabilities we can move uh, uh, most quickly is air and naval forces, which is also part of the deterrence in the, in the Baltic region. So, uh, yes, we are constantly assessing uh, the, 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 the need for uh, presence of ground troops uh, 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 across the whole alliance, including in the Baltic region. But I think it's extremely uh, important to understand that uh, our ability to defend every inch is uh, also about our ability to reinforce and have a credible uh, deterrence, and that's exactly what NATO is about, and that will be also demonstrated uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Vilnius. Um, uh, then on the, on the Wagner forces, well, I think it's too early to draw the, any final conclusions so, of uh, what kind of uh, consequences that will have. Uh, the mutiny, the events we saw, uh, are uh, internal uh, Russian matters. Um, then uh, uh, maybe some of, or we are following and monitoring what's going on very closely. Uh, we have seen uh, that uh, some of these uh, forces may be uh, deployed to, uh, to, to Belarus. But again, I think it's too early to draw an, or, uh, any final con uh, conclusions. The most important thing is that uh, we are sending a very clear message to any potential adversary, including Moscow and Minsk, that we are there to, to protect and defend uh, every inch of Allied territory against any threat. So uh, we have increased our presence. We will uh, uh, further strengthen our deterrence and defense at the Vilnius summit, and then we'll continue to monitor exactly what happens with the Wagner forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, um, the, as, I, as it was uh, addressed for me as well, uh, the defence plans. Uh, I think they're they're good. We also need to make work in in, in practice, and that that is what we are doing. Uh, that the combat readiness of the troops is is really not a word on the paper, but actually in real life, and that actually requires the defence investments of all, all the allies to increase as well uh, to uh, be uh, ready. Uh, to fulfil the uh, the uh, warehouses uh, uh, regarding ammunition, the uh, equipment uh, necessary, um, but I'm uh, I'm also uh, uh, I agree uh, what was said that uh, Alliance is ready to defend every inch of its uh, territory. What comes to Belarus, we have considered Belarus as a go aggressor in this uh, war, so uh, nothing has changed in this regard. We know that uh, Belarus, as Russia, is unpredictable and is dangerous, and uh, this hasn't changed. So uh, clearly, our stance, uh, our forward defense uh, stance, hasn't changed in this regard as well. I think uh, uh, we are also. Uh, ready for, for any uh, development. Delphi? Delphi, I guess please first. Thank you. Hello, Hermann Gellom is from Delphi in Estonia. Question to both of you, to both of you about the pathway to membership uh, for Ukraine. I've been speaking to some officials and it seems that rather than getting a pathway to membership in Vilnius, uh, Ukraine will get a promise of a pathway and that this will be decided upon later in Washington. So what is the most positive scenario that is realistic for Ukraine in Vilnius and what would an actual pathway look like? 
Well, so first of all, I think it's too early uh, to um, pre-announce uh, uh, the outcome of the Vilnius Summit. Uh, there are ongoing consultations, as there always will be when we have important decisions uh, to make. Uh, but I'm absolutely confident uh, that uh, at the Vilnius Summit, allies will uh, find common ground also on how to address Ukraine's uh, membership uh, aspirations. And we have to remember that allies actually agree uh, on uh, very more, many important uh, messages and, and, uh, and positions regarding uh, Ukraine and membership of uh, NATO. We all agree that NATO's door is open. We have demonstrated that uh, recently by inviting Finland and, uh, and Sweden. We all agree that uh, Ukraine will become a member of this alliance. And, uh, and we all agree that uh, uh, it's for the NATO allies and, and, and Ukraine to decide when the time is right to invite Ukraine to be a, a member of the alliance. But perhaps the most important thing we agree on is that, uh, is that uh, uh, the most urgent task now is to ensure that Ukraine uh, prevails as a sovereign independent nation in Europe. Because uh, if President Putin wins this war, then there is no more membership issue to be discussed at all. Uh, so the, the main focus should be how to ensure that Ukraine uh, prevails. Uh, and, and that's the precondition for any meaningful discussion about uh, further uh, membership. Mm -hmm. Let me add one more thing. We are going to strengthen our practical support, uh, which will bring um, uh, Ukraine closer to NATO, uh, a multi-year program for uh, making Ukraine fully interoperable uh, with NATO forces uh, is an important step. And we're also discussing how to further strengthen their political ties, uh, including by uh, uh, potentially agreeing a NATO-Ukraine uh, Council. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I have uh, not much to add. Uh, we have to work on the wording uh, so that every, everybody is on board and the worries that some allies have uh, regarding uh, further steps and, and also uh, the hope that we should give uh, to Ukrainians as I'm really confident that uh, any grey zone uh, in, in Europe is a source of conflict and war and actually the only security guarantee that really works is NATO and I can tell this uh, by uh, my own country's history. The reason uh, we are not living through some really dark times right now is because we are in NATO uh, and that is important. And that is also important uh, for, uh, for the prosperity of uh, European uh, uh, continent because uh, if uh, you don't have wars, uh, you have investments, you have economic security, so it is in our interest uh, that we find this uh, pathway. But, uh, but the wording is still uh, being working out and don't want to uh, somehow spoil the surprise of, of the Vilnius Summit. Last but not least, Deutsche Welle. <laughs> Chavela, thank you. Um, I wanted to drill down on, on um, my colleague's question on military mobility. Uh, Prime Minister Carlos, you said famously almost exactly a year ago that you feared the Baltic states could be overrun and that it would take NATO 180 days to kick out whoever's forces who might be overrunning you. Are you convinced that military mobility has moved forward now? Not just that you have stockpiles somewhere else, but that you could get them to a crisis spot fast enough. Um, it, 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 those are part of the regional plans. Um, and Secretary General Stoltenberg, are you disappointed that at the budgeting that the EU has given this project? It was slashed to practically nothing. It was going to be a big flag, flagship cooperation project for NATO and the EU. And do you think you could get the forces there fast enough. Has Turkey agreed to these regional plans now so that m mobility, thank you, my colleagues are nodding, so we all want the ans these answers. Um, is military mobility really going to take a big step at Vilnius? Mm. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, this is a big issue. First of all, uh, we have moved from the deterrence posture to defence posture, which means that uh, we are uh, not in in a way of, uh, uh, you know, uh, conquering the territories back or liberating the territories afterwards, but we are uh, ready to defend the territories from the first minute uh, and the first centimetre. Uh, what, uh, of course, there's room for... Um, uh, uh, some development regarding the military mobility, but uh, what I want to stress now is that we have Finland in NATO. That uh, changes the whole picture because uh, because of the military mobility, not only making us as a peninsula in terms of uh, NATO, but actually uh, being uh, in the middle. Uh, so so uh, the help could c come from from different uh, ways. So so I'm I'm pretty sure that we have uh, moved uh, from. Uh, 
the situation where we were a year ago by the good decisions that we made in Madrid and also the execution of those uh, plans and, and now uh, going further uh, with, uh, uh, with those plans um, uh, as well. So, uh, of course, uh, there is room for uh, development. We have to do more, but uh, it is still much better, uh, the situation. NATO has, uh, over the last years, uh, since 2014, um, implemented the biggest reinforcements of collective defence in the generation. An important part of that has been uh, and continues to be military mobility. Uh, because uh, uh, to be able to reinforce quickly is a critical part of uh, the way we are providing deterrence and the way we can reinforce and, uh, and, uh, and uh, deter any aggression against uh, any NATO uh, ally. So what has happened over the last years is really a, a significant also improvement of military mobility. There has been uh, huge investments in infrastructure, in military uh, transport and logistic capacity, uh, more pre-positioned uh, supplies and, uh, and, uh, and equipment. Uh, and uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, we are working very closely with the European Union. Uh, I will meet, uh, actually, the European Union. I will be in the European Council tomorrow, uh, together with Kaya and all the other uh, EU leaders. And military mobility has been part of this cooperation. But this is not only dependent on the budgets of the European Union. This is very much financed by uh, the national budgets uh, for investments in, uh, in military capabilities to ensure uh, mobility, but also in civilian uh, infrastructure, which is important to ensure military mobility. Then, this is something we not only do in words, but also in deeds. We have the battle groups. Uh, we are actually now exercising uh, the ability to scale them quickly uh, up to brigade size levels. I returned from Estonia this week, where we had a big exercise uh, demonstrating exactly that. We had earlier uh, exercise in Estonia to scale up the, the British uh, battle group. And an important part of that is to exercise and demonstrate military mobility to get these forces quickly in uh, to uh, the territories, the countries uh, we want them to be. Um, uh, then I totally agree with um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Carlos that the fact that Finland is now a full-fledged member of the alliance also changes the whole security uh, geography in uh, the Baltic Sea uh, region. Uh, because if you look at the map, that has uh, profound consequences for our ability to reinforce, move forces uh, quickly into the Baltic region. And soon Sweden also will be a member that will further strengthen our ability and, to, and, and make it easier to move and to reinforce uh, forces if, uh, if needed. We will continue to work with the European Union, but again, the, the, the main task of NATO is not to, re, uh, to liberate land. The main task of NATO is to prevent any attack on any NATO ally. And, that, and this is deterrence, and it has worked for almost 75 years. We were able to deter aggression against West Berlin. We didn't have any forces in West Berlin, in the middle of East Germany, but deterrence was credible. Uh, I'm coming from a country, Norway, uh, the northern part of Norway didn't have any uh, uh, so NATO troops uh, at all, but the border with Russia, deterrence worked. So this is partly about forward presence, but it's also about uh, exercising, demonstrating uh, the ability to reinforce in a credible way to prevent any attack at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we will agree the regional plans. I'm absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. Good evening to you all. Welcome to this pre-NATO summit meeting uh, press conference in The Hague. We have a couple of statements, and after that there's room for Q&As. I would like to give the floor to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Rutte, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. And uh, together with uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, uh, today I had the pleasure to welcome colleagues from Albania, from Belgium, Lithuania, Norway, Poland, and Romania. We, as allies from different parts of the NATO area, have looked ahead at next month's NATO summit in Vilnius. And one thing is clear to us all. This will be a crucial summit, one that centers on the increased threat around the NATO area and the Russian war in Ukraine. In recent days, we have all watched events unfolding in Russia with great concern. And much is still unclear. But I refute what Putin suggested yesterday, that we 
in the West want Russia to descend into domestic chaos. On the contrary, instability in Russia creates instability in Europe. So we are concerned. These developments are further proof that Putin's war has achieved nothing but more instability. Above all, it has inflicted intolerable suffering on the Ukrainian people. And with that in mind, we need to stay focused on our goal, making sure that Putin's war against Ukraine fails. It's our moral duty because this is an unjust war. This is a war against everything we stand for. Freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. And of course, the war is a direct threat to our own security, because if successful in Ukraine, Putin will not stop there. And so Ukraine can count on our unwavering support. And in Vilnius, we must take clear steps that are supported by all member countries. Steps that send a clear message to everyone, including Moscow. Ukraine's future and rightful place lies within NATO. And we will continue supporting that ambition. The Netherlands is taking responsibility in this regard. We are working hard to enhance Ukraine's air defenses, and we will remain committed to that goal. So that cities and innocent civilians will be protected from Russia's brutal missile attacks now and in the years ahead. And when it comes to further shaping NATO's relationship with Ukraine, it's up to us to decide. To Ukraine and all the members of our alliance, not Vladimir Putin and not the Russian Federation. In that sense, Lithuania is an appropriate location for next month's summit, because Vilnius is a perfect symbol of what it means to choose your own destiny. After all, the path Ukraine is taking now is the same path taken by other countries on Russia's border over the past 30 years. Just look at where NATO stands today, with 31 member states. It's bigger, more relevant, and more united than ever. And hopefully, we will soon have 32 because our next task is to make sure Sweden becomes a full member as soon as possible. Putin's plan has backfired. With his ruthless aggression, he hoped to divide us. But now he knows we will continue to stand firm for our collective security, with a strong, credible deterrent on our eastern flank and high levels of defense spending that will remain high across the entire alliance. This evening, we had a good informal discussion, and I look forward to continue this in Vilnius. And now, I'd like to hand over to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Jens, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Prime Minister Rutte, dear uh, Mark. Uh, thank you for uh, your warm welcome, and uh, thank you for hosting NATO allies here tonight. And it, is, it has been an honor to be your co-host here at this uh, very important uh, dinner where we have discussed the preparations for the upcoming uh, NATO uh, summit. We all saw the events in Russia over the last uh, days. Uh, these are uh, internal Russian matters, but what is clear is that President Putin's illegal war against Ukraine has deepened divisions and created new tensions in Russia. At the same time, uh, we must not underestimate Russia. So it's even more important that we continue to provide Ukraine with our support. And I expect that our summit in Vilnius um, uh, in a couple of weeks' time will send a clear message of our commitment. The Ukrainian forces are now pursuing a counteroffensive. The fighting is hard, but they are making progress. The more land the Ukrainians can liberate, the stronger their hand will eventually be at the negotiating table. I commend the Netherlands uh, and allies uh, present here tonight uh, for providing critical support to Ukraine. 
This includes your contributions to NATO's comprehensive assistance package and the Dutch and Danish-led initiative to train Ukrainian pilots on F-16s. At the summit, we will agree a multi-year program for Ukraine, and we will upgrade our political ties. This will bring Ukraine closer to its rightful place in NATO. During the dinner, we also discussed the next steps to strengthen NATO's deterrence and defense. We are putting in place new defense plans. We designed forces and capabilities and high levels of readiness. Yesterday, I was in Lithuania to visit Exercise Griffin Storm, which demonstrated that we are, can quickly uh, reinforce the German-led uh, battle group in Lithuania. And it also sent a clear message, NATO is ready to defend every inch of Allied territory. At the NATO summit, I also expect Allies will agree on a more ambitious defence investment pledge, with 2% of GDP for defence as a floor, not a ceiling. Russia's war in Ukraine demonstrates that we cannot take peace for granted and that we must invest more in our security. So again, Prime Minister Der Mark, it is a great pleasure to be here tonight uh, together with you and the other NATO allies. Thank you, Jens. I would like to give the floor now to the host of the NATO summit in Vilnius, the President of Lithuania, Gitanas. Uh, please, uh, your remarks. Dear colleagues, dear all, it's timely opportunity to be here in The Hague to discuss the upcoming NATO summit. Thank you, Mark, for your hospitality. The Vilnius NATO summit comes to the eastern border of Alliance. This is symbolic at the time we are living. Since the NATO summit in Madrid, security situation in the eastern flank has only worsened. Russia deploys tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Last Saturday, we all have seen the mutiny of the Wagner Group in Russia. If Wagner deploys its serial killers in Belarus, all neighboring countries face even greater danger of instability. Under such, uh, such circumstances, deterrence and forward defense is a top priority. New regional defense plans are of particular importance for us. Furthermore, these plans should be made executable as soon as possible. In Madrid, we agreed that battle groups will be scaled up to brigade size units where and when required. The joint threat assessment clearly answers the question where. The Suwalki corridor bears crucial strategic importance not only for the defense of the Baltic region, but also to the whole alliance. As for question when, my answer is, we needed them already yesterday. For us, an essential element of forward defense is combat a ready allied brigade in place. Let me remind you about specificities of our security situation. Lithuania is between heavily militarized Kaliningrad and Belarus. So reliance on reinforcement only no matter how fast, won't work in our case. For all that, we need an ambitious renewal of the Defense Investment Pledge. Two percent is the bare minimum floor, not a ceiling. We need to invest more to strengthen our defenses to deter threats, reinvigorate allies' defense industries, and to continue supporting Ukraine. Lithuania remains steadfast in increasing defense spending. In 2023, it has reached 2.5% of our GDP. We allocated additional 1 billion euros just for host nation support to ensure the best infrastructure for allies' deployments and presence in Lithuania. One more very important question we will discuss in Vilnius is the future of Ukraine and NATO relationship. 
Lithuania is a staunch supporter of Ukraine's membership in NATO. Ukraine is part of the Euro-Atlantic security architecture. We should agree on a political pathway for Ukraine towards NATO membership and make this pathway as simple as possible. We support the creation of NATO Ukraine Council. The inaugural meeting of the Council could be held in Vilnius. Last but not least, I do expect that we will be able to greet Sweden as a, sec a 32nd NATO ally in Vilnius. It is still possible. Thank you. Thank you, Hitenas. I'd like to give the floor to the President of Poland. André, please. Thank you very much. Distinguished Presidents, Distinguished Secretary General of NATO, Distinguished Prime Ministers, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Prime Minister Mark Rutte for hosting us at this informal meeting organized just two weeks before the Vilnius NATO summit. We are all aware that it will be the key NATO summit given the security situation in Europe after the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Over the last 16 months, Poland has taken serious steps to strengthen its security and by doing so, NATO and Europe's resilience in the face of the Russian aggression. We have made historic investments in our infrastructure, technology, industrial and military capacity. Additionally, we've deepened our engagement and alignment with allies and partners around the world. I appreciate that we can count on other allies in that matter. We are going in the same direction that's safe and prosperous Europe and a peaceful world order. But at the same time, we know that there is still a lot to do with regard to security of the NATO member states, Europe, and rules-based global order and international law. During the meeting, I indicated five areas of major importance to us. They are related to challenges we have been dealing with. For Poland, it's vital to strengthen and further adapt NATO's deterrence and defense, ensure long-term increase in defense spending by all allies, support finalizing Sweden's accession to NATO, provide necessary assistance to Ukraine and bringing it closer to NATO membership, and develop a long-term approach on how to respond to Russian military, economic, and political threats. That is the backdrop for the NATO Vilnius summit preparations. Finally, I would like to stress that the meeting that we have had just was very candid, very in-depth and constructive. Thank you again, Mark, for that opportunity to meet and discuss the issues that impact our countries now and in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. André, thank you. Thank you so much. And now I give the floor to the President of Romania, Klaus Johannes, please. Thank you. Good evening. Let me start by conveying a word of appreciation for Prime Minister Mark Rutte for hosting us. Thank you so much, dear Mark. We had the opportunity of a very constructive and open exchange of views in an informal setting in advance of the Vilnius summit. Of course, we have also discussed uh, the events of last weekend in Russia especially their potential impact on the management of the war in Ukraine by Russia. The Vilnius summit will be an important moment for further consolidating our alliance on many dimensions. First, we will be able to capitalize on the progress achieved in consolidating our deterrence and defense. In Madrid, we have clearly recognized the strategic importance of the Black Sea for the Euro-Atlantic security. The current evolutions are obviously demonstrating, once again, the validity of this acknowledgement. Russia is 
and will continue to be the most direct and immediate threat to the Euro-Atlantic security. Thus, we must be able and ready to further enhance our posture and continue to provide necessary support for Ukraine and for our most vulnerable partners, especially for the Republic of Moldova. Deterrence and defense is one major line of effort where we hope to see the full implementation of the Madrid decisions. The Alliance needs a strong, long-term posture, a true forward defense capable to respond to all threats. Given our strategic location, Romania is particularly interested in further consolidating the eastern flank in a coherent and unitary approach. This means ensuring the necessary forces, structures, capabilities, and equipment, as well as the right command and control arrangements. Second, it is also about providing that, of proving that we are capable and willing to back these transformations with a reinforced commitment to invest in our defense. The 2014 Defense Investment Pledge has been key in helping us advance towards a stronger alliance. It is now the time to move forward. Romania is ready to assume all necessary responsibilities. As a matter of fact, as I have already announced in Madrid, starting as of this year, the national defense budget increased from 2% to 2.5% of our GDP. Third, being effective as an alliance is also about working closer for the benefit of our partners. Ukraine remains at the center of our efforts. The summit must have a clear and substantive, substantive result for Kyiv by advancing our political and practical support, including for the concrete, measurable progress of Ukraine's accession to NATO. Romania's support for Ukraine and for its aspiration to become a full-fledged ally is well known. We will continue to be a strong advocate of Kyiv. It was in Bucharest in 2008 when the Allies decided that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. In Vilnius, we have to take this commitment further. It is a matter of responsibility and trust in our relationship with Ukraine, as well as a matter of credibility for the Alliance. In Vilnius, we look forward for a meeting with President Zelensky, hopefully in the format of the new NATO-Ukraine Council. Fourth, we should not lose sight of our most vulnerable partners in the region, especially the Republic of Moldova. Its security and that of Ukraine are connected. And their security is interlinked with our transatlantic security. If they are stronger, our region is stronger, the Black Sea is safer, and then the whole Allied territory is safer. We should continue to closely engage with Chisinau, especially given the tremendous efforts this country made in support of regional security and stability since the beginning of this war. Let me conclude by restating our unwavering commitment for a stronger NATO. As a dedicated ally, Romania will continue to act as a responsible security provider in the Black Sea region. I'm looking forward to the Vilnius summit and all its concrete results. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus, and thank you for also putting Moldova uh, at the center uh, of your remarks. And I think uh, that was very, very wise words. So now I'd like to give the floor to the Prime Minister of Belgium, my neighbor, Alexander de Croix. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for this, uh, for this invitation. I think it led to a very good discussion we had over a very nice dinner. Um, Darianz would like to thank you also for your continued leadership. 
Um, this Vilnius summit uh, was going to be an important one. I think after this weekend, it is even more clear how important this, um, the, this summit is. I think over the past months, we've shown a lot of solidarity with, uh, with Ukraine, necessary solidarity. And I think we can never show enough solidarity. I think that solidarity only has value if we continue that solidarity at a moment like this. And I think all of us have done um, big efforts in supplying for the battlefield, in supplying for a population that is, that is really suffering, in preparing for the reconstruction, but also providing so political support. And that is the reason why we're meeting here, is to see how we could provide that continued political support. It is clear that Ukraine one day will be part of NATO. I think that is crystal clear to everyone here. The question is, what do we do in the meantime? And in the meantime, we need to do two things. First of all, we need to provide a good political framework to make sure that we, that we continue to, to have this rightful discussion together with our Ukrainian friends. Secondly, we need to provide the necessary to security guarantees. And, and those questions by Ukraines are, are obviously totally righteous uh, questions. To finish, um, our meeting in Vilnius will be uh, the first time together with our friends from Finland, and we're really happy to welcome them there. And I would hope that the next meeting will be a meeting where our Swedish friends will also be present. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, now the floor is for the Prime Minister of Norway, Jonas. Please. Thank you, Prime Minister Rutan. Thank you for uh, convening us. I'll be short. I come from a meeting of Nordic Prime Ministers together with Canada's Prime Minister in Iceland in recent days. We have discussed issues that touch on the ones we have discussed here. We are preparing for uh, the summit in Vilnius to be a summit of unity, of um, the real strength of NATO. And a few points on that. First, I think we have to secure that there is relevance in our plans and relevance in our structure. I think we have done a good work, and I'd like to commend the Secretary General for leading that work, updating our plans with our military um, uh, uh, staff. Then we need solidarity expressed on two particular dimensions across the eastern flank. Uh, and events that we have seen in recent days underlines that necessity. We are on good way. On the, my way to the summit in Vilnius, I will visit Norwegian troops in Lithuania, where we are side by side with other allies providing that security. Then, of course, there is Ukraine, where I believe we are on track to come up with a strong message of support. There is daily support from our countries in terms of military support. Norway has adopted a five-year plan to support Ukraine every year for five years, military, economic, and humanitarian support. We will reiterate that in cooperation with NATO uh, allies. And Ukraine should be secured a path of further integration with NATO. And finally, as my colleagues have underlined, in Madrid last year, we agreed that Finland and Sweden fulfilled the criteria to join NATO. Finland is in its rightful place. And there is no time to lose to get Sweden also in line. It fulfills all the criteria, and Norway will do what it can, together with allies, to secure Sweden's place on this line of allies. Thank you so much, Jonas. And now uh, a great leader on the Balkans, but also a great leader in NATO. Eli Rama, please, Prime Minister of Albania. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, let me say it's... Uh, Special honor to be here with all of you, and also I cannot hide my admiration for you as a breaker of the stereotype about your country that is a place where you don't eat well. So uh, congratulations about that. And uh, jokes aside, I want to say that uh, it's very inspiring to be part of NATO in these times and to see that uh, the solidarity, the firmness and the will to be with Ukraine all the way is unwavering. And whoever uh, bets on the chance to break this solidarity and to divide NATO has lost and is going to lose till the end. On the other hand, I cannot but uh, confirm what was said on Ukraine and uh, want to use my uh, little minute to 
uh, add that uh, we could also discuss about the warring situation in the Western Balkans, uh, precisely in northern Kosovo, where some uh, days, weeks ago, uh, KF4 soldiers were hurt. And uh, we very much hope that uh, common sense uh, will prevail and uh, de-escalation will start as soon as possible because uh, every further escalation can bring to a catastrophic end and we don't want to see a break uh, within our region, which has done so well in the last years. And in the meantime, we want to see the EU-facilitated dialogue succeed, of course, with the full support of NATO, which is uh, responsible for the presence of KF4 as an instrumental presence in this uh, worrisome times. So, uh, Mark, thank you again, and uh, it's a big honor. Okay. Now we have time for uh, Q and A's, and the first question is for Simon Aiken from NRK. Yes. Thank you very much. I have a, a question for the Secretary General Stoltenberg. Uh, following the statement earlier by the President of Lithuania, does the new confirmed presence of the Wagner warlord in Belarus change NATO's security evaluation concerning its member states? And if I may, uh, Mr. Secretary, could you let us know when you will let us know uh, that you will stay on as uh, Secretary General for a while longer? Thank you. First, on uh, the consequences uh, of uh, the mutiny or the events we saw in Russia over the weekend and over the last days, I think it's too early to uh, make any final uh, con uh, conclusions on uh, the long-term uh, consequences, including for uh, NATO. Uh, but what we can say is that uh, uh, we are, of course, closely uh, uh, monitoring the developments. And uh, we have already increased our readiness, our uh, preparedness, and uh, uh, our military presence in the eastern part of the alliance. We will make further decisions to further strengthen our collective defense uh, with uh, more high readiness forces and uh, uh, with more uh, capabilities to ensure uh, uh, credible deterrence and defense uh, for the whole alliance. We'll make those decisions at the uh, upcoming NATO summit uh, in just uh, a few uh, days. Uh, what is absolutely clear is that uh, we have sent a clear message to Moscow and to Minsk that NATO is there to protect uh, every ally, every inch of NATO territory. And uh, we do that uh, through what we communicate, but also through our actions by, uh, over now several years, uh, significantly increase our collective defense and the way we invest in our uh, uh, shared uh, security. So uh, no misunderstanding, no room for misunderstanding in Moscow or Minsk about our ability to defend uh, allies against any potential threat. And that is regardless of uh, what you believe will be the final consequences of the of the uh, movement of the Wagner forces. I think it's also actually too early to say exactly where those forces will uh, end up and whether all of them will end up in Belarus. Um, when it comes to, uh, uh, to myself, I, I have made my position clear many, many times. I have uh, uh, nothing more uh, to, to add. Uh, I don't seek uh, an extension, and that is, uh, that is what I've stated many times before. Second question is for Anthony Deutsch from Reuters. Please go ahead. Good evening. Um, could you maybe, uh, this is for Secretary General Stoltenberg, um, maybe a little bit in more detail about how concerned you are that Prigozhin has moved to Belarus um, and that his, the Wagner forces may follow him. And what assurances um, can NATO give uh, to its members on the eastern flank who have been today um, expressing concerns uh, about that move? Or what, what can NATO do to alleviate those concerns? Thank you very much. So I, I just believe it's too early to make any final judgment about the consequences of uh, the fact that uh, uh, Pergosin has moved to, to, uh, to Belarus and uh, that uh, most likely also uh, 
uh, some of his forces will also be uh, uh, located to Belarus. Uh, it's too early to, to, to say. But we will monitor and we will ensure that we uh, always are ready to protect and defend uh, every NATO ally, and especially those allies which are now uh, which are border countries to, uh, to Belarus. Uh, this was also addressed in the dinner, uh, and uh, uh, it just demonstrates that uh, it has been a right decision uh, of NATO over the last years, actually since the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, to implement the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War, with battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, uh, uh, with, uh, with higher readiness of our troops, and also after the invasion of Ukraine, um, uh, in February last year, we doubled the number of battle groups and we further increased our military presence in the Eastern Part Alliance. One of the uh, uh, neighboring countries of Belarus is actually Lithuania. Um, uh, I was in Lithuania uh, yesterday and this morning, uh, and I saw uh, how uh, uh, NATO troops and German troops uh, exercised on how to scale up the current battle group in Lithuania to a full brigade size uh, 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 presence. And also we saw the announcement of uh, Germany uh, as a NATO ally to further increase its presence in, uh, in, in Lithuania. So we have the readiness, we have the forces, we have the plans, and not least we have the commitment and the resolve uh, to uh, deploy what's, what is necessary when and whenever uh, needed to ensure that there is no misunderstanding about our ability to uh, protect every inch of NATO territory. And we do that not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent the conflict, and that, uh, that is a message we send to any potential adversary, of course, including uh, Moscow and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Minsk. Next question for Anke Traje, Nieuwsuur. Um, question from Dutch Press for Prime Minister Rutte and Secretary uh, General Stoltenberg, and any other leader who feels the need to respond. Mm. Um, did you all agree today on concrete steps regarding Ukraine's NATO membership? And what are these steps? And will the Netherlands and other NATO members send more troops to countries on the east flank? I hear there is readiness and there is a will and hope, but will the Netherlands and other countries send more troops? Thank you. Well, first of all, on Ukraine, um, uh, I think uh, the president uh, of Lithuania already expressed that very clearly, but also president of Romania, that after Bucharest, we have to move further ahead. So we cannot just stick with the Bucharest language. Um, so we are looking into decisions we can take at the uh, NATO summit, which give a clear signal. Uh, to Ukraine that their future is firmly within NATO. And we are now looking into very specific measures we can take, one of them being already mentioned in one of the introductions, a, this idea of having a NATO-Ukraine Council, where uh, auf Augenhöhe, so really uh, at the same level, you would work together uh, between the 31 NATO countries and uh, Ukraine. Uh, these discussions will continue over the next uh, 10 days and two weeks, uh, leading to, I firmly believe, uh, agreement uh, at the summit in Vilnius. Uh, on your second question, uh, we all agree that we have to do three things. We have to look at Moldova, the Black Sea, and generally the eastern flank. And when I say this, that also means that we all have to be willing to assess again what we are already doing and can we do more. We have not taken decisions on that, uh, but clearly this is uh, something which is on the table. And, and Germany, uh, yesterday or today, made a clear announcement on their commitment uh, towards Lithuania, which is a commitment others could follow, but again, decisions have to be taken. I can just uh, underline what uh, um, Prime Minister Rutte just said. Uh, the consultations are ongoing. Uh, we. Uh, uh, are preparing the upcoming NATO summit, uh, where I, uh, as uh, Mark Rutte, uh, I'm absolutely confident that we'll find common ground on uh, how to address uh, Ukraine's uh, membership uh, aspirations. But let me just remind you of the following. Allies agree on a lot, also when it comes to membership for Ukraine. All allies agree that NATO's door is open, and we have demonstrated that by inviting Finland and Sweden to join the alliance. All allies agree that Ukraine will become a member. We have stated that again and again. And we also agree that uh, it is for uh, the NATO allies and Ukraine to decide when Ukraine 
uh, should become a member, it's not for Russia. President Putin does not have a veto on NATO enlargement. But then the most important thing all allies agree on, not only in words, but also in deed, uh, and that is that the most uh, imminent, the most uh, urging task now is to ensure that Ukraine prevails, that President Putin does not win in Ukraine, because unless Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent nation, there is no uh, membership issue to be discussed at all. Uh, so we focus on that, the military, the economic support. All the allies uh, standing here have provided significant support to Ukraine. And I'm absolutely confident that at the summit we will also step up and sustain our support uh, for uh, Ukraine. We will also move forward on the membership issue by strengthening our pr uh, practical support for Ukraine, including a multi-year program for transition from Soviet era equipment to NATO standards uh, and procedures. Uh, strengthen the political uh, ties with the uh, NATO Ukraine Council, and then also, of course, find a way to address the specific uh, way forward on uh, the membership issue. Next question is for reporter Urbanik van Polsat. Good evening, Grzegorz Urbanik from TV Polsat. I have a question for President of Poland, Andrzej Duda. I'd like to ask you about uh, main uh, issues, expectations of Poland before upcoming summit in Vilnius. I precisely think about uh, Polish security, the security of our borders, and uh, the presence of uh, American soldiers in Poland. Thank you. The adaptation of NATO to the upcoming situation in Belarus is uh, one of the main issues I hope we will discuss during the NATO summit in Vilnius, and, and in my opinion, it, 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 it requires also our decisions. It's difficult to say if we make those decisions uh, during the upcoming uh, summit in Vilnius, because it's rather difficult process, but I hope that we will discuss this issue. Uh, we heard those questions of, of, of uh, ladies and gentlemen here about the, about the, 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 the Wagner's group in, in Belarus and the, the presence of Mr. Prigozhin in Belarus. In my opinion, this is really serious and very concerning problem and, 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 and we have and we have discussed and we have to make some decisions, very strong decision. It, in my opinion, requires a, a very, very, very tough answer um, of NATO. Thank you. Next question is for Skodrani from Albania. Please go ahead. Good evening, Bernada Shkodrani, Albanian Public Television. Uh, Prime Minister Rama, you compare the situation in North Kosovo uh, with uh, Donbass in Ukraine. Uh, did you discuss the situation with Mr. Stoltenberg and the other colleagues? And uh, what can we see as the solution? Thank you. Thank you. No, just uh, to make it uh, clear, I uh, simply stated that uh, the perspective uh, of uh, the creation of uh, little Donbas in the middle of Europe uh, because of uh, further escalation is a real threat and uh, we all have to do what we have to do to prevent it to happen by encouraging on one hand the dialogue, bring it even in a higher level in the European Union with the support of US and on the other hand by making very clear through uh, NATO that uh, KF4 is there to guarantee the full integrity and also stability in case of any disruption that uh, can, be, can happen exactly because of uh, irresponsible de-escalation. So this is uh, my concern and uh, we shared it and uh, I felt in Brussels, I feel here, that uh, everyone understands that it's time to act and to not allow this spiral of, of absurdities to take down uh, what we have built so far with the help of the European Union in our region. Thank you. Final question is from 
uh, Isopescu from Radio Romania News. Please go ahead. Thank you. For Mr. Uh, Klaus Johannes, um, you talked about Moldova as a vulnerable, vulnerable partner. Uh, is going to be Vilnius a different, uh, is going to bring Vilnius a different approach between NATO and Republic of, of uh, Moldova? Uh, could it be uh, a new kind of assistance? And for Mr. Stoltenberg, sorry, the next meeting between Turkey and Sweden, could, could it be the decisive one for Sweden to become a, a NATO member? Thank you. The Republic of Moldova is uh, an important preoccupation for me. Yeah. And uh, as I found out today, it's not only me, it's all of us. Uh, the situation in Moldova is dire. And I think it's our responsibility to find ways to help Moldova to enhance its resilience, its, its entire situation. And uh, I'm very glad that the colleagues uh, share this evaluation. And it would be really great if we had remarks on these issues in the conclusions at Vilnius. It's still possible to have a positive decision on uh, Swedish uh, membership um, by or on the uh, Vilnius uh, summit in, uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, I spoke with, um, with President Erdogan uh, about this on Sunday. Um, and my message is that uh, Sweden has uh, implemented uh, and delivered on uh, the agreement that was made between uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, Turkey, uh, uh, at the NATO summit in uh, Madrid uh, last year. And now the time has come to ratify and to uh, uh, complete the accession process for uh, Sweden. This will be good for uh, the Nordic uh, uh, countries, for the Baltic region, for, uh, and for the whole of NATO, including uh, Turkey. Um, uh, we agreed uh, to convene a, a new meeting of um, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, uh, Turkey and NATO. Uh, this meeting will take place uh, in Brussels next uh, week. I will share the meeting and uh, it will be a high level meeting with the foreign ministers, the chief of intelligence and the national security advisors. And the purpose of that meeting is of course to make progress so we can have a positive decision uh, by the Vilnius summit on uh, Swedish membership. Thank you all for sitting in the press conference. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.